Well, good evening and welcome to the Good Friday evening study here from Linwood Orthodox Presbyterian Church. An email was sent out earlier uh, today and another one not a few minutes ago, just a few minutes ago, uh, containing the subject matter for the live stream, namely Isaiah chapter 53. And in an email just a few moments ago, I sent you an outline of the study. So we'll just take a second here to let you uh, open up your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53. And also maybe open up your email if you'd like to have the outline. Uh, it's not necessary for you to follow the study to have the outline, although you might find it helpful uh, as we work through the material, know where we are and know where we're going. But we'll begin our study tonight by having a scripture reading. And as we said, this is coming from Isaiah chapter 53. Now, Good Friday, of course, commemorates the death and the sufferings of Jesus, who was crucified on a Friday and then rose again, of course, on Sunday morning. And so we celebrate Good Friday today. And then uh, Sunday morning, we'll have an Easter themed study on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, followed by another uh, doctrinal study in the evening at 6 p.m. But this time we're going to read Isaiah chapter 53 together. This is, of course, the English Standard Version, the version that we use at church. This is what it says. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a shear sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Thus far, God's word in our study tonight. Let's pray together and ask for the Lord's wisdom that we might understand it. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior. We thank you, Lord, for his death on the cross for us, that which brings us life and righteousness and forgiveness. We thank you that in the midst of uncertainties and difficulties at this present time, we can all join together at this time to remember that which is most important for us, that we live in a sinful world and that we indeed are sinners, but that there is a Redeemer who has been sent from heaven, who has become true man and suffered and died and experienced all the miseries of this life, but is now victorious in heaven. Help us, Lord, tonight, especially as we meditate to seek to better understand the teaching of your word. 
regarding the death of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, Isaiah 53 is a significant text for the New Testament and for the Christian faith in many, many ways. For one thing, it presents to us in pretty precise detail, in a prophetic detail, many of the things that Jesus was going to experience during his incarnation and especially during his suffering. In fact, we say in general that the New Testament speaks more clearly than the Old Testament, and that is generally speaking true. But sometimes we get an Old Testament prophecy that's exceptionally clear, that speaks to us with a detailed clarity that uh, seems to come up to the same level as some of the Gospels. And that's certainly true here. When we read through this passage and we read about Jesus as a man of sorrows, we think about him uh, we, uh, sweating drops of blood in, in Gethsemane. We see, think of him uh, shedding tears at the death of Lazarus. We see him saddened at the unbelief of the people. We, we, we bring to mind specific details in the Gospels in which Jesus is said to be a man of sorrows. Likewise, when we look later in the passage and read about how he was with the rich man in his death, the gospel writers draw our attention to Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich man who, of course, buried Jesus, who brought him to the tomb and took care that he had the proper bur burial. And likewise, the fact that he was numbered with the transgressors. So Jesus hung on the cross with two criminals at his right hand and at his left hand. And likewise, it said that he makes intercession for the transgressors. And so Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Indeed, the book of I the prophet Isaiah and many other passages in Isaiah tell ahead of time in great precise detail many of the things that Jesus was going to experience. And in this way, it's important for us to prove to us the truthfulness of Scripture that God, years ahead of time, foretells and predicts exactly what's going to happen, and that's ratified by eyewitness testimony in multiple Gospels. But there's something else the book and the prophet of Isaiah does here in this chapter, and that's not only describes for us the facts or the details of what Jesus would experience, he also interprets them for us and explains to them in his prophetic and poetic way the meaning and the significance of these sufferings of Christ for us. You see, it's one thing to believe that Jesus suffered and died. That's a fact of history. You might accept that that fact occurred and not have true faith. We simply call that historical faith. And if we just believe that they happened without understanding their proper meaning and interpretation, we haven't truly understood what Jesus came to do. We have to remember the Bible does both things. It both records for us the facts of what happened in history, as that focuses on God's mighty acts of redemption, but it also interprets for us and explains those facts. Now, using the book of Hebrews in the New Testament as a helpful guide, but anchoring ourselves firmly in Isaiah 53, what we'll find tonight is that there's really two things that this passage emphasizes in terms of why Jesus had to suffer and die and what the significance of those things were for us in our redemption, and they really boil down to these two things. First of all, Jesus' suffering and death in a human body allows him to have a special sympathy with us in our weakness, or here's an old word for you, our infirmities. In other words, that first point is that the sufferings help him have sympathy with us in our sufferings, our difficulties, and especially in our temptations. But the second thing, and I think more important thing, is that this work of Jesus had a vicarious or a sacrificial character. And so in addition to helping Jesus have sympathy with us, that he might be moved to be our redeemer and continue to pray for us and make intercession for us, Jesus' death on the cross was also that which paid the price for our sins and brought forgiveness and righteousness. So it's those two things. It's that Jesus' sufferings and death allows him experientially to have sympathy with us in our infirmities and weakness. And then secondly, it's also that which brings us forgiveness and righteousness. So let's think about those two things together. First of all, let's think about this idea that Jesus, as he's become a human being, a true human, and especially as he suffered and died as a true human, that one thing that helps him do is it helps us have sympathy with us 
in our weaknesses. Now, if we look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, we'll see both the points we're making in a way summarized. We're told right at the end that he bore the sin of many. That's the legal side. That's where he's paying for our sins. But then the fact that he then makes intercession for the transgressors. That intercession of Jesus, those prayers of Jesus, are, high, are, are to a great degree an expression of his sympathy for us. Think of it this way. When do you pray for people? You pray for people. Sometimes we do it out of a sense of duty. We don't necessarily feel the way we should about the person in their difficulties. But we pray because we know we're supposed to, and even though we don't feel the way we should. But quite often we are really moved to pray for people when we feel sympathy for them. When we hear about somebody, a fellow brother or sister in Christ, who's going through something that we've gone through. For example, I've experienced back pain in my life. And I know how debilitating and hard it can be. And when I hear about somebody having back pain, it's not hard for me to say, okay, I need to stop and pray for that person. Or if somebody's lost a loved one, a father or mother or, or, or a child or something very tragic, and you've experienced that as well, I'm sure you know how easy it is. I don't want to say easy, but you know, you know how powerful it is to be moved to pray for someone in those difficulties. Well, Jesus in becoming a human being, and especially in suffering and dying, is moved to great sympathy for us. This is an amazing thing because when we think about our sympathy on the human level, it's a very fleeting thing. Sometimes we feel it for somebody and other times we don't. Sometimes our sinful nature gets the better of us and when we see someone suffering, we will then compare our sufferings to theirs. We might think that our sufferings are worse and for that reason, they're not worthy of any pity, and our hearts are hardened to them. This is all the more the case if we feel someone is suffering on account of their own unrighteousness or on account of their own sin. We then exalt ourselves and our own uh, pride, and we feel that because we're better than them, they deserve something, whereas we might not have. And if there's anyone who has any right to claim such a notion, is it not only Jesus? For he experienced suffering and misery and didn't deserve any of it and the bottom line for us as sinners is every bit of suffering we experience we truly deserve but what does jesus do even though he doesn't deserve his suffering and even though we're the cause of it he has sympathy for us in our weaknesses again let's anchor ourselves firmly in the new testament because that does clearly outline this as one of the reasons jesus suffered for us on the cross hebrews chapter 2 verse 17 tells us that Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Note the connection. His identification with us, especially in our sufferings, helps him to become a merciful high priest. Mercy is what we show to someone in a pitiable or miserable condition. And more clearly, if we turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and look at verse 15. Here we read the writer tell us. It's chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. You see, Jesus' sufferings and his temptations give him an experience, an experience in a human body. He walks in our shoes such that he can say, when that saint of mine goes through trial and weakness and difficulty, I know exactly what that is. I know how hard it is, and I overcame it through my power and through my righteousness. And so we have this clearly stated in the New Testament, but we also have it outlined here in the details of Isaiah 53. Let's just think of a few ways that Jesus here identifies with us in our miseries and in our infirmities. And as we walk through the passage, we're just going to highlight a few things. We can't get into everything. The first point that might surprise you is his identification with us in the suffering connected to aging. As we grow older, our bodies change, our appearance changes changes. We may not think we are uh, attractive or as handsome or as beautiful as we might have been. And some of us get quite self-conscious about this. 
more significant as we grow older and joints don't work the way they're supposed to and we feel aches and pains, that bothers us a bit more. Eventually, we reach years where we're far from being concerned about our appearance. We're concerned about the proper function of our vital organs. This is the suffering connected with aging. Now, you might at first think, well, Jesus doesn't really know what this is like. After all, he, he entered his public ministry when he was 30 years old, and he died when he was only 33. Did he really experience suffering connected to aging? Well, the picture we have in the Old and New Testament is that, yes, very likely he did, and uh, to a degree that we might not appreciate because we're so used to seeing those pictures of Jesus, of course, which shouldn't be made, which present Jesus as this, uh, this strong, uh, handsome-looking guy, usually quite muscular, uh, with a very attractive appearance. Uh, those pictures are very far from the picture we have in the New Testament. Here in Isaiah, if you look at uh, Isaiah 53, verse 2, you'll notice that it starts by describing him as growing up like a young plant and a root out of dry ground. You see, that's the beginning of the growth. That's the, the youth. That's the start. But then it quickly, jarringly moves to a different description. It says, he has no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, there's nothing in his physical appearance that would commend him to us as a great king or a great ruler. Think of, of course, David and Saul in the Old Testament. When they looked at Saul, they thought, man, this is the guy. He's a head taller than everybody else. He's big and strong. Nobody's going to mess with this dude. Let's make him the king. And then, of course, what happens? They find him hiding behind the cargo bins, scared to go up in front of people. And instead of him, who do you have? You have David, who's a small boy, or considered a young man, or having a boyish look. It doesn't look anything like a warrior or a king. Indeed, we have indications in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, the, the Pharisees, as they're conversing with Jesus, they have this comment they make. They say, you are not yet 50 years old, and yet you claim to have seen Abraham. Now think about that comment. At the time, Jesus was in his early 30s, yet they use 50 as the barometer for his age. That indicates he probably looked a lot older than he actually was. And also the fact that if you consider the fact that the life expectancy average of that time probably wasn't much more than 50. 50 probably was pretty old. Then that puts it even to sharper relief. You see, the reality is Jesus was often praying. He was fasting. He was devoting all of his physical faculties and energies to fighting against temptation and sin and of devoting himself to God. And if you think about the mental focus that that required and the energy from within and the discipline that he had with himself, perhaps you can understand why he may have appeared older than he thought he was. So we know from this that Jesus experienced that which was common to aging. Whether we're being a bit too speculative here or not, we, of course, know that Jesus did grow older, and he experienced, especially in his sufferings in accelerated fashion, the decay of the body as that led to death. So that's the first thing that's indicated here. But there's a second point here in verse 3, and that's the fact that he experienced grief from social rejection. Again, that's a fancy modern way of saying exactly what it says in verse 3, that he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. One thing emphasized in the Gospels, especially in some Gospels, this is especially highlighted, is the loneliness of Jesus on the cross. The, the text tells us that everyone left him and fled. Not just Judas, who betrayed him, but also Peter, who denied him. Jesus had his 12 disciples who were there to be with him and to pray with him and were part of his band of followers. They all left him and fled on the cross. He was there all alone. And, you know, a lot of us have had a family. Maybe we've had a church. We've grown up in a group of people that's given a lot of us a lot of stability in our lives. When we experience social rejection, that can be a really hard thing to deal with. Some of, this, some of us struggle with this on a regular basis. We're concerned about what other people think of us. If we get even the smallest hint that there's a negative feeling towards us, we're overwhelmed with nervousness and with shame, and we're tempted to just simply want to withdraw. 
Well, think of Jesus. He experienced that. He knows exactly what's that like. In fact, he knows exactly what that, that's like better than any of us could because he was rejected, not just by his disciples and by his close friends, but by all human beings. The man, mankind which he came to save rejected him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Christians in this world will experience social rejection. How many of you, when people might inquire about the things you might believe, you're a little nervous to tell them? Do I really want to tell this guy what I believe? Do I really want to get out there and tell him I'm a Christian? Because he's probably not going to like me very much. I think all of us feel that to a certain extent. That's the fear of social rejection. It's a powerful thing. And not just if you're a Christian. It's a powerful thing no matter who you are. Well, Jesus experienced that on the cross. But then thirdly, there's the pain and difficulty for discipline and punishment for sin. Now, let's be very clear here. Jesus had no sin that was his own. But he did experience discipline. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that he learned obedience through what he suffered. He was disciplined, not for his sins, but he endured discipline for our sins and for our sakes. And that's what Isaiah 53 verses 4 to 5 indicates, that he bore our griefs, he carried our sorrows, that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted, that he was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. And notice this, upon him was the chastisement, the punishment, the discipline that brought us peace. See, all discipline is painful. It's a hard thing. Now, kids, let me talk to you because this is something I think you can relate to. Sometimes, you know, if we do something bad, what does our mommy and daddy do? Well, they might just simply tell us with their words. Son, daughter, honey, you can't do that. And if you do that, you're going to get in trouble. Hopefully, they start with a verbal warning. And then what happens if you don't obey and you still don't listen? Well, if it goes on at some point, depending on what you did, you might have to get a spanking. And spankings aren't any fun. I know, when I was a kid, I got spankings too. Sometimes I think I probably still should get spankings. Now, that's not an invitation for any of you kids to try to spank your pastor. You shouldn't do it, okay? But we all know exactly what it feels like afterwards. You feel sad. You feel like you let your mom and dad down. You feel like you're disappointed. You feel like you're not very good. And so we as parents also not only need to discipline you, but we need to encourage you afterwards and tell you that we love you and reinforce our love for you. And that's what we try to do. Well, that feeling that you have after you get in trouble, Jesus had that feeling. Not for his sins, because he never did anything bad. But every all the shame, all the sorrow that goes along with it, Jesus experienced on the cross. And why? Why did he need that? Well, think about it, because on one level, Jesus was God. And God knows everything. So on one level, in terms of his general knowledge of everything, he already knew what a human being would go through. But when Jesus became a man and suffered and died in a human body, that knowledge was deepened in a way that, dare we say it, is new. Not that God in the divine nature adds to his knowledge, which is impossible. But Jesus in his human nature did grow and learn and learn that obedience and he did it so that he might have sympathy with his people who have to go through it as well. Isn't this amazing thing, an amazing thing? That Jesus, in everything he calls us to, has experienced it first himself. Now let me give a brief illustration here. I don't want to take too much time. I want to move to the second point to illustrate this. My dad was in the military. And when he was in the military, he was on a submarine. And it doesn't matter if you're on a submarine or on a, some other kind of ship. But there's really two approaches you can take if you're going to be a leader in wartime or in the military. One is to be very detached, to be apart from the people, and in that way to try to project power and distance so that you have respect and honor from the people and from the men who serve you. And some have taken that approach and they're able to be somewhat effective with it. But when my father speaks about the captains or the leaders that he really respected, it was the ones who were willing to get their hands dirty and get messy, so to speak, with the soldiers in battle. It's not the ones who sit in the tent at the back of the battle directing the soldiers. It's the ones that are right up there with them in harm's way. If the soldier knows the captain is willing to bear the pain and the difficulty that he's sending the soldiers to do, he'll, he'll engender their respect. 
Well, that's the kind of captain Jesus is. He's a soldier that's gotten down in the trenches with us, the trenches of life, and he's experienced all of it. And what has that helped him do? Well, it's helped him to have that heart of sympathy and compassion for us and to pray for us and to continue to pray that in heaven that we might preserved, be preserved in our faith. And even on the cross, think about how great this compassion is. While he was enduring the greatest injustice ever imagined on the cross, the sinless one dying as a sinner, what did he do? With a heart moved with compassion, he prayed for the people there. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. It's an amazing thing. And that is because Jesus, through his experience of trial and temptation and suffering and misery, has sympathy with us in our infirmities. But that's only one side of what Jesus came to do. In fact, that sympathy is really a means to an end. It's something Jesus has that he might do something else even more significant for us in his death. And that's the second point we'll look at tonight, which is bringing us forgiveness and righteousness. You see, there's an experiential side to what Jesus did where he might show us his love and affection and compassion and have that sympathy for us. But there's also a legal side. And in fact, this legal side, as we said, is really the end goal God is working towards in his work on the cross. This is what he's coming to accomplish to purchase redemption. You see, Isaiah 53 indicates in different ways that Jesus is both a priest and an offering. Now, if you go back to our studies in the book of Leviticus, we've seen how in that book it talks about these things. There's a priesthood, those who minister on behalf of God, giving gifts and offerings for sin. And there's also offerings. There's the animals. There's the lambs, which make atonement for the sin in the case of a burnt offering. And, of course, there's the grain offering and the fellowship offering. And we can get into all those details later. If you want to go back and look at those studies tonight, we're just looking at what would correspond to the burnt offering or the sin offering. In Isaiah 53, 10, we have him in view as a priest, that, or excuse me, as an offering, one who offers himself, that he makes his soul an offering for sin. But in 53, 12, we have his work and his office as a priest, that he makes intercession for for the transgressors. Again, if you want to remember, what does a priest do? If your pastor ever asks you, just randomly, I'm going to start doing this to people. Hey, what's a priest do whenever we get back to church? And there's a simple way to answer that question. The priest pays and the priest prays. He pays for sin through the offerings that he makes. He makes his soul an offering for sin and he prays for sinners. He makes intercession for the transgressors. And so Jesus here in this passage largely and with great emphasis is presented as that sacrificed and as that priest who will bring us forgiveness and redemption. How does it do that? Well, we'll talk about three things. First of all, in general, we'll talk about how the work of the suffering servant here in Isaiah 53 is work that is what we call vicarious. In other words, it's done on behalf of others. He's taking upon himself that which is someone else's and accomplishing something for them. Now, this idea is fundamental to our Christian faith. It's fundamental because we confess as Christians when we become members of the church, we confess that in ourselves, we are totally unable to to please God, to serve him, let alone to earn anything from him, and that we're dependent totally on the work of someone else to help us. That requires humility. That requires that we lower ourselves before God and before others and confess that we can't do it on our own. We can't be good enough to God. And again, if we go back to Leviticus, we saw this. If you read Leviticus chapter 1, there's a dramatic picture of the fact that the offerer, when he would come to the temple, he put his hand directly on the animal and he transferred, as it were, his identity and especially his sin to the animal. And on the day of the the atonement, the high priest would go and on that Lamb of the Day of the Atonement. He would put his hand upon it and he would place upon it all the sins of all the people of Israel. That's what we call a vicarious sacrifice. And all throughout Isaiah 53, the vicarious character of his sacrifice comes to the forefront. Just look at a few of the verses. In verse 4, we're told that this suffering servant, Jesus, has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows. Again, think of our sins as something that you could put in a backpack to be carried away. 
Who's the one who's going to pick up that backpack of our sins and take it away? Well, Isaiah 53 says that Jesus came and he bore that backpack. He carried it on his back and took it, to use the language of Leviticus, outside the camp that it might be taken away and removed from us. Or if we look later in verse 6, we're told that all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned to our own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Again, even as the high priest laid his hand on the lamb for that transfer to take place, so the Lord has laid upon this suffering servant the iniquity of us all. Or look down to verse 11. There we're told that this righteous one, his servant, shall bear their iniquities. Again, it's being carried upon his shoulders that he might take them away. This vicarious work of Jesus is so important. Jesus didn't just go on the cross to somehow show us with some kind of opulent extravagance how, how much he loved us. It's not as if he just on the cross, as it were, went out and just spent a lot of money, not because we needed it, because he just wanted to show what great lengths he would go to show his love. No, Jesus had to die on that cross, and it does show us his love, but it shows us his love in that he is bearing upon his shoulders, upon his body, on the tree, our sins and our unrighteousness. So it's, in a general sense, it's vicarious, it's in our place, it takes upon him what is ours. And what does he take? Well, we've hinted at it a little bit, but let's look into greater detail. First of all, one thing that he takes, that he takes away, is our sin. Part of Jesus' work is negative. It removes something from us. Again, if we go back to an illustration I've used a lot, I think it's effective because most of us who've been to school at least and taken a test can understand it. If we take a test and we get every answer wrong, we're going to have written on the page the wrong answer and probably a red mark with red ink through it. And what do we need to do if we're going to do better on that test? Well, we better erase all our wrong answers, right? Or at least cross them out. Well, Jesus has to erase or cross out our sins. And Isaiah 53 uses language throughout that indicates that that's exactly what Jesus came to do. Again, in verse 11, it tells us that he bears what? He bears our iniquities. Or verse 12, yet he bore the sin of many. Or again, verse 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so we're told in the Psalms and elsewhere, blessed is the man whose sins are covered, whose transgressions are forgiven, against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Jesus, through his work, covers over erases, forgives, takes away the sinful record that has to cling, us, cling to us by God's righteous legal demand. Everywhere we go as human beings, we are haunted by the sins we have committed in the past. We know this experientially because even we who are Christians often are haunted and feel haunted by sins we've committed in the past. Well, if we believe in Jesus, what we know he's done, according to Isaiah 53 and the rest of the Bible, is that he has borne those sins, he's erased them, and he's taken away. But again, we have to recognize that Jesus didn't just come and live and not sin. Jesus also came and obeyed. Not only did he have to do something to remove, to negatively take away sin, we not only need to be sinless, we need to be righteous. Adam in the garden was required to obey God, to accomplish a task that was given to him. And as long as that task remains undone, we cannot stand as righteous before God. But we know from this passage that Jesus' work not only takes away sin, positively speaking, it grants us his righteousness. Again, we have this put in a negative fashion, although it points to the same thing in Isaiah 53 verse 9. There we have a hint of the innocence or the sinlessness of Jesus. Here it tells us that he was with the great wicked in his grave, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. This is indicated in the gospel writers by Pontius Pilate of all people, who pleads with them, essentially saying, 
Why? Why crucify this man? He has done nothing wrong. He even has to wash his own hands and say, I am innocent of this man's blood. Jesus was sinless. He never committed anything wrong or any sins. But also, look at uh, later in this same passage, we're told directly in verse 11, by his knowledge shall the righteous one, note that description of him, not just sinless, but righteous, one who has obeyed. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. Not just having not sinned, not just counted as those who have been forgiven, who have no record of wrongdoing, but as those who are righteous, as those who have obeyed. And so Jesus went actively like a lamb to the slaughter. He did so freely at the command and at the call of God. But he likewise also was the one who made his soul an offering for sin, did so willfully and actively for our forgiveness and our redemption. See, this is an amazing thing when we think about Good Friday, when we think about Jesus dying on the cross, because really it is for us the foundation and the sum and substance of our redemption, that Jesus was our priest, that he was our sacrifice, that he was our sin bearer, and that he was our righteous one. Even though we are guilty and deserve everything that he experienced, Jesus endured it in our place so that as we trust in him, we can have forgiveness. You see, it's a beautiful thing. Jesus, in his incarnation and death, has taken hold of us. He's taken our human nature. He has taken it to himself, and he's lived and died in it. So that we, by faith, might then take hold of him and have in him righteousness, forgiveness, and life. Now let's just think for a little bit about this truth in light of all that we're experiencing right now. There's a lot we could say, so I'll just focus on a few simple points. One thing that I think you see is very common nowadays as we talk about these things, and as uh, many of us are not very happy about not being able to do very much, and as society suffers under this virus, one thing that I think we're often tempted to do is to blame our leaders or blame those over us. <clears throat> now, I don't mean this in a political partisan way. The governor of some states leans to one party, the president leans to another, and everybody seems to be wanting to do it across the board. Now, I'm not saying political leaders aren't responsible to make good decisions and they shouldn't be under review and shouldn't have accountability. They should be, and I'm thankful in this country we have checks and balances. So please don't understand what I'm about to what I say in that way. Instead, let's think about our human nature. What are we doing when we do that? What are we what are we recognizing when we're doing it? Well, we're failing to remember that we live in a sinful world. And that the government that God gives us is not the solution to the ultimate things that ail mankind, although it is certainly there to restrain and to help and has a positive role, and we can have a robust debate about what that should be. But it's not our ultimate solution. Part of the reason we get disappointed with our leaders is because we are expecting them to bring about a salvation and a redemption in our lives that we simply can't have. And does not our reaction to this betray our forgetfulness that everything we experience in this life ultimately comes from the fact that we're sinners, including disease. But isn't it an amazing thing for us to remember that this very passage tells us that Jesus bore our griefs, that Jesus carried our sorrows. Indeed, as some uh, later passages in the Gospels indicated he bore our illnesses and carried our diseases. That was part of his suffering in this world. You see, a disease that goes around, a virus that goes around is but one form of the suffering that we experience as we await the redemption of our bodies. And the suffering we experience from a disease is just a preview of what we all must ultimately head towards Save those who are alive at Christ's coming, which is the total decay of the body succumbing ultimately to death. But what is the hope for Christians? It's not that someday we might have some treatment that can give us a nice band-aid from 
having to deal with the serious effects of illness in this world, although we're thankful for God's providence when we have that. Our ultimate hope is what we look, what Jesus looked to on the Sunday morning, which is resurrection. When this body won't just be healed for a time from a temporal disease, but when this body that we have, the body that Jesus had and still has now in heaven, will pass from that state of corruptibility and decay into incorruption, when it will pass from that time of weakness into power, when it will pass from that phase and era of shame and dishonor into honor and glory. And we know that hope is certain because we know with certainty that Jesus has risen from the dead and Jesus lives in heaven now in the same body in which he suffered on the cross. That's why when he appeared to his disciples, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. And he showed it to them and to us as a pledge that one day, all the sufferings that he bore on that cross will bear fruit in resurrection and glory. Or as Isaiah 53 says, he shall see the travail of his soul and he shall be satisfied as he sees the accomplishment of his work. May that be a hope and encouragement and comfort to you as we await for that glorious day. Amen. Let us conclude as we pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful prophecy in the book of Isaiah that declares for us in glorious detail all that Jesus underwent as he suffered and died. We thank you too that it reveals to us what that means for us as believers, that as we look to Jesus in faith, we know we have one who can sympathize with us, who has experienced all that we've experienced, whether it's pain or difficulty in the body, whether it's rejection indeed, whether it's betrayal. Lord, we know that can be such a painful thing, but Jesus knows what betrayal is. And we thank you that he's there to help us when we experience it. But we especially thank you, Lord, that when he died on that cross, he bore the sin of many, that he took the backpack of our sins off of our shoulders and he put it on his and he carried it away. And he took them and he removed them as far as the east is from the west and he hurled them into the uttermost depths of the sea. Lord, we do pray that you would help us rejoice in this great work that we've been given and help us, Lord, not to grow slothful or lazy as we are so prone to, but to grow in zeal and in desire to serve our Savior and to give our lives fully to him even as he has given his life fully for us. For we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, that concludes our Good Friday evening study. We thank you so much for joining with us and with this meditation. Again, we'll resume again on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. We'll have a Easter theme to resurrection, resurrection theme study out of the scriptures, much like what you had here tonight. And in the evening, we'll look at the Westminster Confession, most likely on the communion of saints, since that flows very much out of the risen Christ and the church's union with him. So I'm going to allow a few moments here for the video to play without me present, just to make sure nobody gets, get, gets cut off at the end. But once again, uh, thank you for joining us.